right? So as we imagine, imagining us sort of at the lakeside. So we'll imagine we're there this morning. Uh, so again, look at the PowerPoint this morning. This is going to be different. We're back to the way it used to be. Uh, everyone have an order of service with you? Okay. And you'll be able to, all the words, the hymns are in your order of service, or you can pull out your hymn book uh, in front of you as well. They're all from the red hymn book today. Send the waters of your grace upon us. Let the waters of your love wash us. Let the waters of your blessing pour over us. We are your beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Shall we gather up the river? 710 in your red handle for the words are in your order of service. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's Spirit sets us free from the powers of sin and death. Know that you are forgiven. And forgive one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. I trust our boys and girls are having a, a safe and happy summer. We enjoyed the company of our children this past week and encouraged them to join us again when Sunday school starts. Uh, reading a little bit about our, our passage today, it, I was thinking last week it was called shipwreck, but that comes up under the oceans. So we're still in the lakes today, and we turn to Jesus calling his disciples along the lake shore. And I was learning a little bit about the nets that the, the fishermen would put out into the water, and they um, they fill the nets with stones in order for them to sink. And then, of course, once they're down, they pull, pull in, and whatever they catch, they sort through, and uh, hopefully catch lots of fish. So, does anybody fish with a net like that? <laughs> Sounds uh, quite uh, laborious, really. Let us join our, our hearts together in the Lord's Prayer and then sing our children's hymn. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> and this is what Jesus is asking in our gospel lesson today. When you come and follow me, it's 567 in your red book where the words are in your order. So
playing her marimba for us this morning. And she's indicated that if you feel like dancing in the, in the aisles, we can. Yeah, you can eat the one. <clears throat> so, um, this has a little bit of history, if I might be interested in. Um, it's called a marimba, very similar to a xylophone, except the things you get are wood, in this case made of rosewood, instead of steel. And these pipes are resonators, which makes the sound amplified. Uh, they're open on the top and sealed on the bottom. It's all hard. It all comes with a part, and on this side with a big steel handle to uh, carry it with you. And it comes from an old traveling band in the 1920s um, that would go from small town to small town. They had guitars and drummers and marimbas and probably a trumpet player, maybe a saxophone player. And they would, that's how they made your living, just traveling town to town. I got to find it in an old junk store once when my kids were in high school. And um, my 16-year-old, um, it was his birthday, and what do you want for your birthday? He says, I want one of those old icebox fridges that they used to put chucks of ice in. I want to use it as a clothes closet. Okay? So we went looking through the stores, and we found one at this place near Tempo, a huge place. And um, in the office part where they had like the more expensive things, this was set up. So, of course, I picked up the mallets and started playing it because it's actually like a piano. Um, these are white notes and those are black notes. So it's all set up the same. And I uh, fell in love with that. And of course, I had no money. I've been sitting on here to buy my son's fridge, so, you know. But anyway, so the proprietor was very nice and he let me mail him $10 a week. And he held it for me. And then it was mine. And since then, it's been played countless times by countless people in any combination of bands. And it sounds pretty good if I get somebody to play a with me, also. So that's another option. Anyway, I'm going to play you songs from it. We want to do And feel free to come up and try it after church if you want. You can just play like anything, and it just sounds awesome. <laughs>
and immediately the news about him went out everywhere into all the surrounding district of Gaza. Calvary's the word of the Lord. Lord, speak to us now. Your word. May your spirit rest upon us, our minds cleared of all the many things that we're thinking of and yet to do today. Rest your spirit upon us. May these thoughts and words challenge us and speak your word in truth, of truth. In Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Covering about 70% of its surface, water is Earth's most abundant natural resource and a basic necessity, of course, for human life. And this was especially felt as well during the time of the ancient, the people of the ancient Near East, where water was often in scarce supply. Accordingly, they commonly lived along river banks and other bodies of water or dug wells in order to provide a supply of available water for drinking and cleansing, as well as for irrigation purposes, so as to ensure the fertility of the land. The imagery associated with water is likewise present in the scriptures. I'm just going to highlight a couple. Um, a few illustrations of the Old Testament include Lot, who chose for himself the whole region of the Jordan because he saw that all of it was well watered. Or the scriptures teach that water, it's, in its various forms, is under divine control. It is God who set the water in place in the original creation and supervises its placement and boundaries. God uses water in accordance with his own purposes. That includes the flood waters of judgment, such as the flood of Noah's day, the parting of the Red Sea at the time of the Exodus, an act that allowed the Hebrews safe passage through the surrounding walls of water, but after their passing through, brought the judgment of water on the pursuing Egyptians. The beneficial aspect of the Hebrew saint passage through the Red Sea is a reminder that God's control over the water could also provide positive results for his people. For example, God brought water from a rock for the Israelites as they traveled through the desert of, of sin on the way to Mount Sinai. God also assured his people that he would bring them into a land of an abundant water supply so as to ensure the fertility of the land and to meet the people's needs, which he did. Two weeks ago, we heard the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well, the community well. People had to dig the well, and, and, and that was their water source for all of the community. And Jesus shared with her um, the fact that he was the, the living water. And she went and she was transformed by his presence and she met she went and told the whole community about this man that she had met the savior who had changed her life for good today we walk along the seashore might be a little harder to do but can you feel the the warmth of the sand and the softness of the sand on your feet this morning the sand is warm and soft. Galilee in the first century was a place of gathering and, and diversity with many different peoples mixing together. Just the mix of peoples around the Sea of Galilee at Jesus' time is a testament to the changes in the economy and society with Romans and Jews and other peoples gathered around the lake of commerce for commerce. At the Sea of Galilee, Jews and Gentiles filled, fished among one another and came to, to hear Jesus. In the Jordan River, curious peoples came to see John the Baptist. Rather than places of division, the lakes and rivers were places that people were drawn together. And there was still, of course, division, as always will be, but in their, that environment of gathered peoples, Jesus
Jesus also broke through divisions and brought people together around the lake, Galilee and the Jordan. Just as with oceans from the Old Testament to the New, the fresh water had become a mission field rather than a place marked by turmoil and boundary. And in a similar sense today, our, our, our lakes, bodies of water, people are drawn to them and they want to live around the boundaries of the, of the water supply. And we get certainly a mix of, of people living on the, on the water together. And sometimes it's, it's good and sometimes it has its conflicts, but we're drawn, you know, a mix of people drawn to the, to the water to, to live. Jesus spent significant time in the area of Galilee and he calls his disciples and clearly it reigns over whatever other spirits are there. He heals and he gathers crowds in the area throughout his ministry, bringing people together despite differences and boundaries. Now, if we pause to think about Jesus' call for a moment, you will notice that Jesus does not say to the men, to the fishermen, that if you, they follow him, they will be wealthy. He does not tell them that their lives will be made better. He does not tell them that they will have their best life ever. Jesus does not tell them that their fishing business will, will be more successful if they follow him. Jesus does not tell them that their lives will be easier or more comfortable if they follow him. And there is no part in his, in his wording that says, uh, Jesus' call indicates that Jesus has come to, to work for us. There is no part of Jesus that indicates that. In fact, Paul Tripp summarized this point very well when he said, Jesus did not come to make your life work, make, to make your life work, but to employ you in his work. Simon and his brother Andrew are casting a net into the sea, but Jesus tells them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of people. What Jesus is doing is highly unusual. No rabbi ever told people to follow. The rabbis and sages of Jesus' day told people to learn from the Torah from them. Learn the Torah from them. People would learn from rabbis, but rabbis did not go around calling people to follow him. Further, no prophet ever said, follow me. All the prophets said, follow God. So Mark is showing us that Jesus is not just a rabbi or a wise man or a prophet. His call is authoritative. He's calling for people to follow him. The first people Jesus called were the fishermen, common men working a common trade. Historians say that an average of about 300 fishing boats would be in the water on any given day in the Sea of Galilee, which is about 65 square miles large. There would be there would have been many fishermen out there that day, and Jesus handpicked four of them. Too often, we have a view of these first people Jesus called as, as poor fishermen who could not do anything else. Often the disciples of Jesus are slandered, they sort of be ignorant and never, never quite understood, never got it. First century fishing was a thriving industry on the Sea of Galilee with at least 16 ports around the lake. Fishing was a major industry with a connected sub-industry of fish salting, curing the fish. At a time of social turbulence in Galilee, these two related industries supported each other and remained steady. So these men are not catching fish for themselves for just a simple meal. They're not there trying to catch their lunch, nor was the catch of fish for the local market alone. Fish was a stable food in the Greco-Roman world. Fish from the Sea of Galilee was exported to Antioch, Syria, and even in Alexandria in Egypt. This is a fishing business. This is a career for these men. This is a, likely a successful family business. This is their livelihood. It's their financial stability. In fact, the success of these fishing businesses is further emphasized in the verse 20, when Zebedee not only employs his two sons, the father of the two boys, 
James and John, but owns a boat and employs hired servants for the fishing business. So Jesus calls James and John, and they lay down their fish in the boat of Zebedee's and leave their nets, and the other servants remain. There's nothing small about this fishing that these men are engaged in. This is their careers, and this is how they make a living wage, and how they care for their families and their livelihood. So now, they're summoned to a distinctive kind of service and to leave behind their current employment does not establish sort of a universal pattern for Christian life and vocation today. In fact, most of us who follow Jesus do not quit our, our jobs to do it. Nevertheless, the way in which the demands of the kingdom cut across and override the usual principles of society, they are transferable and helpful in whatever profession, vocation, we have it in or are in. The willingness of the disciples to leave such stability is remarkable. Economic stability is no longer their chief purpose for working. Yet even here, we must be cautious. Jesus does not refuse the earthly occupation of these men, but he reorients it. He calls Simon and Andrew to be fishers of people, thereby confirming their former work as an image of the new role to which he's calling them to. Keep on fishing, but now fishing for people. Although most people are not summoned to leave their jobs or their posts and become wandering creatures, we are called to ground to ground our identity in Christ no matter what we do or what stage of life we're at. Whether we leave our jobs or not, a disciple's identity is no longer fish or person or tax collector or anything else except follower, follower of Christ. And this maybe challenges us to, re to, re to resist the temptation to make our work the defining element of our sense of who we are. Um, Kevin DeYoung, in his right, writing, Just Do Something, a liberating approach to finding God's will, writes this under the title, Calling Means Finding Purpose in Every Kind of Work. God calls his people to lots of different things. Sometimes you feel a sense of calling to your job, and you know, and you know what? Sometimes you don't. You just work. He writes, I'm extremely thankful that I love what I do for a living. I feel badly for people who only tolerate their jobs, or worse. But we must all serve the Lord with heart, soul, strength, and mind, wherever he's placed us. Unfortunately, we've turned the idea of calling or vocation on its head. The reformers emphasized calling in order to break down the sacred secular divide. They said, if you are working for the glory of God, you are doing the Lord's work, no matter whether you are a priest or a monk or a banker. But we've taken this notion of calling and turned it upside down. So instead of finding purpose in every kind of work, we are madly looking for the one job that will fulfill our purpose in life. There's something to that. Jesus called Simon and Andrew, and he used the term fishers of men or fish, fishing for people, a play on words because of their occupation. They were used to catching fish. From now on, they would catch people. What Jesus was saying here, the call to follow, includes the call to bring other people to God. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so if we are followers, we join with him in this important task. Jesus' call, call to Simon and Andrew is the same he issue, call he issues to us today. He calls us to follow him personally, and when we do, when we do he promises to, to change us. Does Jesus always call us away from our possessions or our occupation or our family? 
No. Possibly not likely. But he does cause up, call, call us to follow him without hesitation or reservation. Are you responding to his call? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, you have come to the nation. 563 in your revenue.
this time of year we see growth in the gardens around us and remember the seed of God's word bears fruit in each life that it touches. The gifts we offer today help to sow the seeds of God's word throughout the world that God has created and loves. Our offering will now be received.
Lord God, receive our prayers spoken and not spoken to you. And by your Spirit now, equip us to serve one another in Christ's name, so that your compassion touches lives with love and mercy. May they know of your love. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayers. prayers. Hear and receive our prayers. In Christ we ask. Amen and amen. And it wouldn't be it. Day by the seashore without our anchors. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? 675 in your red handle. And again, we hope you will stay and join us downstairs. <laughs>
ever moved. Amen. Oh,